Hey everyone, Nurse Mike here from SimpleNursing.com. Today we're breaking down the endocrine system, key glands, their functions, and really a deep dive into hyper and hypothyroidism for your exams. Now for all my Simple Nursing members, be sure to download your study guides in the membership area. This will help the hormonal information stick when you're under pressure. Let's jump in. Starting with the pituitary, which I call the testes of the brain since they look like a set of testicles with two lobes, the anterior and posterior pituitary. And very similarly, they too release hormones that helps the body do many functions. So starting with the anterior pituitary, this is the largest part of the pituitary gland and is responsible for synthesis and release of most pituitary hormones. So let's look at the hormone list here. Starting with ACTH, the adrenocorticotropic hormone. The effect on target is that it stimulates the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone and cortisol. And the stimulus for release is stress. The next one is FSH, the follicle stimulating hormone. In men, sperm production is the effect on the target. And for women, ovarian follicles for the release of eggs. And the stimulus for release is the GnRH the gonadotropic releasing hormone. Next is LH, the luteinizing hormone. For men, its function is in testicular. And for women, this is the most important part. It plays a key role in ovulation, the release of the egg. And the stimulus is GnRH once again. Next is GH, growth hormone. This increases during anabolic metabolism, as well as cartilage growth, and catabolism of fat, as well as blood glucose and insulin effects. And its stimulus is normal growth and development. Next is PRL, the prolactin. It stimulates the production of milk in the breast, and the stimulus for release is estrogen, pregnancy, and nursing. Next is TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone. It stimulates thyroids to release T3 and T4 for thyroid needs. Make sure to pull out this study guide for this section so you can follow the key points. Okay, now moving on to posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary does not necessarily produce hormones directly, but rather stores and secrete hormones produced by the hypothalamus, which is what it's connected to. Now for the hormones, ADH, the antidiuretic hormone, so for the memory trick, we use ADH, adds the H2O, because the effect on the target is it adds water back into the body by telling the kidneys to reabsorb water. And its stimulus for release is for decreasing blood pressure, pain, and even high osmolality inside the blood. Basically, really thick blood. So we need to add more water back to the body to dilute that thick blood. Now lastly, we have oxytocin. The effect on the target is maternity. It stimulates uterine contractions and lactation of breast milk. And its stimulus for release is labor and delivery of a newborn or infant that is breastfeeding. Okay, now switching gears to the thyroid. The main ones to know is that T4 converts into T3, the active thyroid hormone, with the help of TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone. So let's play the segment now from the MedSearch course. So as you know, just like all endocrine hormones, it's a big game of telephone, or dominoes if you will. So the hypothalamus releases TRH, which then tells the anterior pituitary to release TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone. And can you guess what the thyroid stimulating hormone does? Well, yes guys, it stimulates the thyroid. Oh, how stimulating. So once stimulated, the thyroid pops out three most important key players, guys, are T3 and T4, which are basically our active thyroid hormones, and also calcitonin, which basically puts a ton of calcium into the bone. So our memory trick is it tones down the calcium in the blood by putting a ton of calcium into the bone. So calcitonin, a ton in the bone. Now our thyroid hormones T3 and T4 are the main focus for our thyroid conditions. Hypo, we have low T3 and T4, and hyper, we have high T3 and T4. And to make this, your body needs dietary iodine found in salt. 
So iodine deficiency is a major cause of that hypo low thyroidism in developing countries. So what causes are high T3 and T4 in hyperthyroidism? Guys, the number one cause is our autoimmune disease we talked about, Graves' disease. We think Gaines' disease in high thyroid. But also, too much iodine means too much thyroid hormone. And even treating hypothyroid conditions, guys, if we give those patients too much thyroid meds, like levothyroxine, which leaves too much thyroid hormones in the body, we can eventually cause a hyper condition. So guys, balancing these two conditions is kind of like a teeter-totter or basically like a seesaw. Hyper will be the exact opposite than hypo. So low T3 and T4 in our hypo comes from that autoimmune disease, guys, called Hashimoto's, that low and slow thyroid. Now other causes are low iodine in the diet. And a big one, guys, big test step here, pituitary tumor. And even antithyroid treatments like a thyroidectomy, where we take out that thyroid gland and now the body can't produce any thyroid hormones at all. Now as far as diagnostic tests, guys, don't let the NCLEX trick you here. So here's a tip. Always focus on T3 and T4 first. Guys, don't even look at TSH initially. If T3 and T4 are high, then it's hyperthigh. And guys, if it's low, then it's hypo. Now, you don't have to memorize any of the values. The NCLEX will give you the ranges. Okay, now after seeing T3 and T4, then we look at TSH. So TSH will always be the opposite of T3 and T4 here. Guys, TSH is just trying to slow the hyper and amp up the hypo. So guys, as far as signs and symptoms, it's super simple. Everything in hyper will be high and hot, and everything in hypo is gonna be the exact opposite, guys, low and slow. Okay, now for the parathyroid glands. The big one to know is PTH, the parathyroid hormone. So to use the memory trick, PTH puts the calcium high inside the blood. So let's play that segment now. Make sure to pull out this study guide for this section so you can follow the key points. The parathyroid glands are almost exclusively responsible for the regulation of blood calcium. So think PC, like a computer. P is for parathyroid and C is for calcium and the levels are typically 9.0 to 10.5. However, some books will say 8.5 to 10.0. So be sure to know what your textbook says. The main point is the calcium, guys. If the parathyroid hormone is high, that means calcium is high. And when the parathyroid is low, what is the calcium? Yes, low. So hyperparathyroid means hypercalcemia and hypoparathyroid means hypocalcemia. That's why I remember PTH, the parathyroid hormone. As an acronym, PTH puts the calcium high. Think of a thermostat or a light switch. This is called our negative feedback loop. When calcium's high, PTH shuts off. And then when calcium's low, PTH turns on. But remember, PTH puts the calcium high in the blood. Now, how does it do this? Calcium is increased in the blood by three ways. So remember the acronym RIB, R-I-B. R is for renals, which reabsorbs calcium, so it's not lost in the potty. I is for intestines. They help to increase blood calcium by absorbing it from food in the help of vitamin D activation. This is a big tip right here, guys, so please write this down. Both calcium and magnesium love vitamin D, and they all work together. So you'll often see calcium, magnesium, and vitamin D all in the same multivitamin. And B is for bone, since our hard bones are made up mostly of calcium. And when your body needs more calcium, it usually drains the bones to get it. So with too much PTH and hyperparathyroidism, there is too much calcium in the blood. It's like every organ is being squeezed for their calcium. Like PTH is the bully, taking all their lunch money. Remember, PTH puts the calcium high, so blood calcium goes goes up, right? So we have stones, moans, and groans. Stones in the kidneys, moans from broken bones, and groans from rock hard bowels. So PTH makes bones weak by taking calcium from their storages. This makes them brittle, meaning big risk for fractures. Okay, so the kidneys, the washer machines of the blood, have to filter out all that excess calcium from the body and into the potty. 
but they get overloaded and we get kidney stones, AKA renal calculi from all that overload of calcium. And lastly, our GI, Mr. GI Joe, our intestinal tract gets overloaded with calcium, causing rock hard bowels, a common sign and symptom of hypercalcemia, too much calcium. Okay, so remember the top three signs of hypercalcemia are usually stones for kidney stones, moans for fractured bones, and groans for constipation. So guys, again, for hyperparathyroid, remember hypercalcemia. Everything is swollen and slow with high, high calcium. And for hypoparathyroid, that means hypocalcemia. Remember Baja California from low, low calcium. And as you can see, we used our electrolyte emoji, Mr. Cocky Calcium, from our electrolyte course. Okay, hopefully you like that segment from Nurse Blake. Now moving on to the adrenal cortex. This is the outer region of the adrenal gland, and it's divided into three separate zones. So the three parts include the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. And the adrenal medulla is the inner part, or the middle, of the adrenal gland. And this makes the fight and flight catecholamines, which is a huge test tip. So please be sure to write this down. Epinephrine, called adrenaline, and norepinephrine, called noradrenaline. So let's play the key points for all the adrenals in this next segment. Get a full breakdown of what you need to pass the NCLEX with our NCLEX Review Lecture Series and live cram sessions, led by myself and industry experts. As you know, the adrenals sit on top of the kidneys and help the body adapt to stress by using MAC hormones. Just like MAC computers, the adrenals look like the Apple logo. So remember the acronym MAC. M stands for mineral corticoids, like aldosterone, AKA aldosterone, our steroid hormone, security guard bouncer to the kidneys, in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Again, remember Al, he adds sodium and water in to balance blood pressure, and L lets potassium out of the body and into the potty. Next is A, for androgen steroids to help with hair and sex. And our first C is for cortisol steroid, our very famous stress hormone, Lastly, C is for catecholamines, epi and norepi, also called adrenaline, are fight and flight hormones, which increase heart rate and blood pressure. Okay, so now that we reviewed the basics of normal physiology, what's going on in hyperal? Well, we have high aldosterone, right? So the ability to add sodium and water into the body is super high, which leads to hypernatremia and hypertension, and the loss of potassium is greater so hypokalemia sets in, and we get a higher pH level as the body loses more hydrogen ions in the urine. This is called metabolic alkalosis. Thanks for watching. Did you know you can unlock beautifully handcrafted study guides, packed with key points and memory tricks from all our videos? Plus, you'll get access to over 1,200 exclusive videos not on YouTube, all neatly organized by Nursing School Topic to make that complex nursing knowledge actually stick. You'll also gain thousands of practice questions written by current professors and actual NCLEX writers. So for access to all this and more, click right up here or visit simplenursing.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Happy studying, and we'll see you in the next videos.